Well, I know we got some little kids in the house today. Any children in the house? Can I hear you? Anybody in here? One of those, that was a husky child. So I, uh... Well, I don't know what you think about when you think about Easter. For me, I tend to naturally start thinking about my childhood and kind of the, the magic and wonder of hunting for Easter eggs and whatnot. But now I'm a parent. I've got three little kids. And so now I start to more often think about their Easter experience and what they're going to do and hunting eggs and whatnot. But as I do that, inevitably, I just start to contrast my Easter experience with theirs. And I got to say, uh, there's been some progress in the way Easter celebrated over the last couple of years. You know, uh, Easter bunny outfits are significantly better than they were in the 70s and 80s. Uh, I remember for me, uh, I grew up and we would hunt Easter eggs on Randolph Air Force Base. And uh, I remember for me, we just thought it was part of the game. You have to make your way past the terrifying Easter bunny to get to those eggs. That's just the way the game's played. So I think there's been some massive improvement here. And I think we all sleep better because of it. Amen? Yeah. Uh, I think the eggs have seen a massive improvement. You know, uh, the, the movement towards more candy, I think it's been a solid move. You know, when I was a kid, it was a bit more hard-boiled egg-based. And uh, there was some fun in dyeing the eggs, balancing them on that little, uh, you know, dipper. But um, it was always a bit confusing to me. I'm like, all right, so, so we're hard-boiling eggs, and then we're going to, Bunny's going to hide them in the, basically he's just stashing our breakfast, and we have to forage for it. Like, what does it mean? And then I'm asking questions like, why am I dying? I'm like, did he hire us? Is he outsourcing production? Or like, did we hire him for distribution? Who's actually in charge here? And uh, it was a bit confusing. But, but the movement from hard-boiled eggs, which I'm a fan of, towards candy, I would say by and large, uh, has been a strong move. And uh, it's interesting. I was studying Easter uh, this year. Uh, the Pennsylvania Dutch tradition in the 18th century said that the Easter money wouldn't always give eggs, candy to children. If you were a naughty child, he did not leave you eggs. Uh, he left horse dung in your bonnet. So I would say the Easter bunny himself has cooled out a lot as the years have gone by. I would call that a good thing. Uh, jelly beans. Uh, I got to tell you, the Starburst jelly bean. Massive improvement in the jelly bean community. I thought it was a bold choice when they entered the game. I was like, I felt like the jelly bean game was on lock. And they jumped in and it's paid off. Kudos to them. Leading jelly bean in the country. It's amazing. The Reese's peanut butter egg. Vastly superior to the Cadbury folks. Whatever that sugary uh, soup is inside. Uh, I don't know if that feels like a controversial take for you, but according to Instacart, Reese's has passed Cadbury as the number one uh, egg in the country. So you can feel some kind of way about it, but the data is on my side that Reese's rules the day, right? So my point is, there's been some progress as the years have gone by in the Easter Bunny community, and I celebrate it. But I want to make this point, and it's this. Not all forward movement through history is progress. And as I think about the world my kids are growing up in, I, like I imagine many of you, are, are concerned when you look and see the uh, anxiety and depression among young people is at record levels today. Uh, Jean, Jean Twenge is a professor of psychology at San Diego State University that's done extensive research on young people, and she indicates that students in America, 12 to 17-year-old, with major depression has risen dramatically in the last 10 years. And that couples well with CDC data that's just recently been put out that says 44% of high school students in America experience persistent feelings of sadness and hopelessness. And some people hear that and they go, well, I mean, do they feel more sad or are they just better at talking about it today? But if you look at the hard data of hospitalizations for self-harm among young people, it's risen dramatically, including among children, a category in which it hardly existed at all. And, and you can look at various factors for that, the rise of technology and the advent of social media, different ways it's impacted the way human beings are developing. We've done that in other talks. That's not for today. But I will say another thing we've seen happen as, as anxiety and depression has risen, particularly among the young, um, an, an ignorance about the word of God has also come home among young people. Uh, the American Bible Society in 2022 did a survey of Americans, and when they asked, how many of you read the Bible, or how often do you read it, 40% of Americans said, never, never. And yet what was interesting is, 
among the youngest among us when asked why, Gen Z said, because I don't know where to start. That was their number one reason. It wasn't an animosity against the scriptures. It was a confusion about how to even interact with them. But when they asked to rate their curiosity about the scriptures and the story of Jesus, well over half of Gen Z indicated they were either very or extremely curious about this word. Now, some of you may go, Ben, I don't understand where you're going with this. Like you're talking about uh, a rise of anxiety and depression and then an ignorance of scriptures. How do these even relate? Well, it's interesting. Harvard has a uh, human flourishing program and, and they released the findings of a study in 2020 uh, that found a strong correlation between interacting with the scriptures and hope. This is Harvard who, uh, again, is not have some passionate Christian position they're trying to advocate And yet they found that frequent Bible readers rate themselves 33% more hopeful than irregular scripture readers. They also found that women who attend church services at least once a week showed a 68% lower risk of death from despair. Men had a 33% lower risk. And they also found that weekly attendance at church reduced mortality by 20 to 30%. So if you were invited here by a friend, they may literally be trying to save your life that the interaction with this old, old story that we've lost a bit of has demonstrable benefit for the emotional and mental and physical well-being of humanity. So sometimes progress looks like innovation. Sometimes it looks like a recovery of what we've lost. And I know for me, it's kind of a wild miracle story. I was able to buy a house in the area. It's pretty fantastic. Uh, but I remember when I did it, the house was built in the early 1950s, and so we had an inspector look at it, and I was like, man, will you just look and see? Is this thing sturdy? Will it stand? What do we got here? And I remember as he looked at it, he was like, man, they don't build them like they used to. And I was like, is that good? Is that bad? And he said, man, they poured these foundations so deep and so strong. He says, you can't buy a new house with as sturdy a foundation as this. They don't make them like they used to. And so sometimes progress looks like innovation. Sometimes it looks like a recovery of solid ground to stand on. Now, as soon as I say that, I I know um, whenever you give Easter sermons, by the way, you can go a couple different ways with it. There's two kind of broad categories. One is sort of the apologetics route, sort of proving the resurrection happened. The other is almost more the emotional relational route where you tell the stories of the first people at the tomb and how exciting it was. But I want to try something a little bit different. If if you've been journeying with us as a church, we we went through the book of 1 Thessalonians. It was a letter uh, written by the Apostle Paul to the Thessalonians. And as he wrote it to them, this was a city, Thessalonica. They, They were young. It was a young church. It was a church that was very successful economically, uh, a church that was very uh, influential politically, and it was a, play, a city that was deeply secular. So try to imagine a city like that, right? Just try to cast your mind. Um, and yet, many people in that city, we read it earlier, Paul said they turned from idols to worship the living and true God and to wait on his son from heaven. And it's interesting, in this letter, um, there's three places where Paul points out Easter, and shows it to him. We read him earlier, but if, if I can read him again, chapter one, he says to them, they report concerning the kind of reception we had among you, how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for a son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. He said later in chapter four, since we believe Jesus died and rose, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who've fallen asleep. And then he said later in chapter five, God has not destined us for wrath but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we're awake or asleep, we might live for him. Now, I tell you what I'm gonna do in the little bit of time we have left. I'm gonna rearrange and reshuffle these verses chronologically to look at what it says about the past and what it means about our present and our future. And so what I wanna do is just give us a window into the old, old story that's worthy to build our life upon. And as we do it, we're going to really see four things. We're going to see a comfort for suffering is going to come out, a reason for living, an anchor for the future, or an anchor for justice and hope for the future. We'll see it again. We're going to see four things. We're going to see a comfort in suffering, a reason for living, an anchor for justice and hope for our future. But if we look at the past, there's this crazy collection of words in chapter one. He says, God's son from heaven died. If you just think about that, that's a crazy collection of words. God died. That's our story. 
that the maker of all things stepped into the story with us. That's a crazy thing to think, that God has a son and he arrived and walked with us from heaven into our story. Uh, it was interesting, I had a friend, Christian friend, that was uh, visiting with a girl that was deeply secular, not religious, lived in Portland, and uh, they were talking about uh, Christian dating dynamics, and he was explaining uh, there were certain you know, intimate activities Christians didn't do in the dating experience, and she just said, man, I just think that sounds so crazy. And I love my friend's answer. When she said that, he went, oh, we believe way crazier things than that. <laughs> he said, we believe Jesus ascended into the sky and is coming back on a horse. Uh, and it's interesting, uh, you know, I was born in Austin, Texas, and Austin has a mantra, uh, keep Austin weird. My friend's mantra is keep the gospel strange. This is a strange story. It's okay to think of it that way. But if you think about it, whenever you're going to tell the human story of how we got here, whatever your philosophy is, as you start to articulate it, it's going to sound crazy. That right now we are spinning on a ball through space, sitting in a theater, having a conversation is fantastic. So however you explain we got here is going to sound wild. Well, I don't know, nothing became something and something got feelings. You're like, that's pretty wild. For us, we believe, no, there's design to all this because there's a designer that someone made us. My kids, I do this to them. I just did it recently. We love to go on hikes around here. And, and you know, whenever you're on a hike through the wild and then come across a staircase, we're out hiking along the river. And I was like, kids, isn't this crazy? how by chance all these trees fell just perfectly perpendicular in such a way that we could walk up and they're like, dad, stop. All right, and, and, and really they're just assuming, no, look, there's a design here because an intelligence designed all this. And the Bible says, yeah, we are made because there's a maker and he made all of this. And then what's crazy about him is the maker of all this stepped into our story, came a part of the story with us from heaven to earth. But then he didn't just arrive in our story. It says that God Son from heaven died. He didn't just enter our story. He entered our pain. He entered our suffering. And he even entered our death. This gives us a comfort in the midst of suffering. Now, it doesn't solve all the questions. It doesn't answer them all. There's other places in the Bible that talk about why we suffer and some of God's reasoning for why he lets the world persist the way it is. But in one of these, there's a comfort in suffering here to know that God is not aloof from your story. The Thessalonians were constantly worshiping idols, trying to placate a deity to leave them alone. They constantly felt that heaven was closed. They turned from their idols to a living God. Why? Because they realized this God is not aloof and indifferent about their suffering. This God stepped into their story, that he cares that I may not get an answer to all of the whys, but I have a comfort of suffering and knowing God is not distant from me. He is with me in the pain. God's son from heaven died for us. It's one thing to say someone died. It's quite another thing to say someone died for us. That involves us objectively and at an emotional level. It connects me. Uh, the largest and most sophisticated uh, destroyer in the Navy fleet is called the USS Michael Mansour. Named after Michael Mansour, was a Navy SEAL that in 2006 was uh, tasked with his men to drive insurgents out of Ramadi. While there, he was in a sniper position and someone lobbed a grenade into the midst of him and two of his men. And without hesitation, Michael dove on the grenade, absorbed the blast. It cost him his life, but he saved the life of his men around him. Uh, our US government recognized him posthumously with the Medal of Honor. It's the highest honor we can give. And in the moment that it was given to his family, uh, the president said, death came for Mikey's friends that day. And Mikey said, you cannot have them. I will go in their stead. We award our highest honor for that act. Why? Because as the scriptures say, greater love has no man than this, than he lay down his life for his friends. And there's a comfort in suffering in the story of Easter because what it declares is God did not stand distant from your pain. He entered it even to the point of death for us. He cares. The maker of all cares about you, right? And not only did he die, here's where it gets even crazier. It says in verse, one, or verse 10 of chapter one, and God raised him from the dead. That's another crazy statement. It's crazy to say that God died. It's crazy to say he died for us. But then it says, and he rose from the dead. That means pain, suffering, and death was not the end for him. 
And it wakens the hope and possibility that it's not the end for us. That suddenly what feels like a tragedy doesn't have to dominate our story. And hope begins to rise. There's a comfort in suffering to go, I may not know the reasons why God allows all to happen. I may not understand why he allows it to persist, but I know that death wasn't the end for him. Maybe it's not the end for me, which incidentally, if you're wondering, that's why we sing. We don't sing if we were just following a list of moral rules. Those would be very boring songs. But you sing if you got a hero who came and saved you. And that's why we sing, because we got a comfort in the midst of the suffering. And we got a reason now for living. That's what happened in the present. Chapter four, verse 14 says, we believe Jesus died and rose again. This is where we get involved volitionally. He did that objectively in history and volitionally say, I say, I believe it. I've witnessed it. I've seen it. I've heard about it. That this story in the past has implications for my future. I believe what happened to him and I believe it has implications for me. We believe he died and rose again. And then it said in chapter five, verse 10, whether awake or asleep, we might live with him. Right there, you get the reason why he did it. Why did God's son enter our story and take on our tragedy? There's a couple reasons biblically, but one of them here is so that we might live with him. He said, if there's a barrier between you and me, I'm gonna cross it to come get you. That's what he said to us, right? That's not just a reason for the cross and the grave and the empty tomb. That's a reason for existence, that we feel a dislocation from the, from the heavens, from God, even from ourselves sometimes. It's interesting, Thomas Wolfe is the, great American novelist from the 1920s to 1940s, inspired everybody from William Faulkner to Jack Kerouac. He wrote this in an essay. The whole conviction of my life now rests upon the belief that loneliness, far from being a rare and curious phenomenon peculiar to myself and to a few other solitary men, is the central inevitable fact of human experience. When we examine the moments, the acts, the statements of all kinds of people, not only the grief and ecstasy of the greatest poets, but the huge unhappiness of the average soul, we find, I think, they are all suffering from the same thing. The final cause of their complaint is loneliness. He says, I look around at us, we feel a sense of relational dislocation. And that relational dislocation feels endless and limitless in its desire. And yet put the pieces together. It's one thing to believe there's a God up there. It's another thing to feel the ache of eternity in our hearts, longing for a connection. But it's something else entirely to hear. This endless ache points to that limitless source. And it's worth singing about when you realize we are not desperately trying to claw to him, but he came down to us. I believe it. I believe he came for me so that whether awake or asleep, we might live with him at the center of the universe. It's not a list of rules. It's a relationship. It's a God who's saying, I'm not far from you. I'm coming towards you. You have an ache for connection that you can't fill, but it's meant to be filled with a limitless source, me. C.S. Lewis said it this way. How does Hamlet meet Shakespeare? How does Hamlet meet Shakespeare? Kids, Hamlet is a character in a play, and Shakespeare is the author of that play. How can they possibly meet? One of them's in the story, one of them wrote the story. Lewis's answer is the only possible way Hamlet will ever meet Shakespeare is if Shakespeare writes himself into the play. And that's what our God did. Our maker, our author, says, I made you to live with me. Colossians says all things are made by God and for him. And so we celebrate Easter, why? Because God wrote himself into our play. I will be a part of your story. I will walk on your streets. I will take on your pain. I will take on your suffering. I will take on your death. And when I beat death, the whole reason I'm doing this is so you might be with me. You are not crawling your way to God. He has come towards you. And the book of Acts says, God has determined the exact times and places we live. If perhaps we will seek him and find him because he is not far from any of you. And that's true in this room today. Maybe you're here, not just to perform a religious duty before brunch, but because God is seeking you and he's not far from you. That's what Easter proclaims, he cares. So then why did he have to die though? What's with the cross part? Well, this provides us an anchor for justice. Chapter one, verse 10, did you notice that he delivers us from the wrath to come? That's a hard statement. We don't like to talk about wrath. A lot of preachers don't like to preach about wrath, especially on Easter when you want everyone to like you as a church, right? That whole thing. Hard to bring up wrath. And yet, all of us like it when we see something wrong. When you 
see something wrong done to you or done in your sphere, we naturally feel anger about injustice that's being done. We feel wrath and we want justice. We all know what that feels like. If, if someone beat you up and stole your things, you'd be mad about it. You'd feel wrath about it. And you would feel mad about it, whether it happened in America or happened somewhere in Africa or happened on Antarctica. You wouldn't feel mad because we all voted in the last election and we chose that beating and stealing is wrong. Uh, you wouldn't say like, my personal preference is to not get beat. It's not about your emotions. It's not about how we voted as a community. You say, no, this is an eternal standard. Don't beat me up and steal my things. I don't care where you came from or who you voted for. It's wrong. We feel a sense of justice that transcends human government. And when it's violated, we feel angry. When it happens to us or when we see it happen to anyone around us, we righteously feel wrath and anger, right? And, and yet, where did we get that universal standard by which we judge the world? It's interesting because you'll hear some people argue that way. Well, how can you believe there's a good God if there's so much suffering in the world? You go, well, you judge that God failing you at a moral standard. Where did you get that universal standard? by which you judge him. Where did you get that universal standard of justice? You got it from a universal law giver. You're not angry at God, you're angry with God because God has indignation every day when he sees people made in his image abused and hurt and, and violated by other human beings. God is a God of justice and we want a God of justice. Without justice, there's no peace. We want a God of justice and yet when we see evil running rampant upon the world, we want someone to intervene. God, make it stop. The government step in. Let's get a mob to shut that down. Some referee blow the whistle. We demand for someone to step in and bring justice. But then when God says, yes, I will, and I am holy, and there's not an ounce of wrong in me, we go, but you do judge on a curve, right? Because some of us, some of us aren't as bad as some other people. I don't want to say who, but if you notice Hitler over there on the right, like we start to <laughs> hope he judges on a sliding scale. And yet we don't want a heaven on a sliding scale. We want holiness. We want peace. We want justice. We want those things. But it's a terrifying thing to see how far short we fall. And not only is it terrifying for us, we realize just learning about ethics or believing in justice is not sufficient. Jonathan Haidt wrote a book called The Righteous Mind, Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion. It's a hard thing to imagine. People divided by politics and religion? What do you mean, Jonathan? Well, he wrote a book about it. But in it, he's talking about ethics and he brings up the question, do people then who are moral philosophers and know the most about ethics among us, does that knowledge make them more ethical? And he researches the study of Eric Schwitzgabel, and he says he tried to find it out. And he used surveys and serotipitous methods to measure how often moral philosophers give to charity, vote, call their mothers, donate blood, donate organs, clean up after themselves at philosophy conferences, and respond to emails in a timely manner. And in none of these ways are moral philosophers any better than anyone else. Schwitzgabel even scrounged up the missing book lists from dozens of libraries and found that academic books on ethics are more likely to be stolen than any other books. <laughs> what is stealing exactly? Well, it's you taking a book, bro, that didn't belong to you. Can't philosophize your way out of this. So even when we know right or wrong, that doesn't necessarily make us right. And that's a scary thing to fall into the hands of a holy God. Someone has to pay for the injustice. I remember a young man coming to me once and saying, but you're saying God forgives me? You don't know what I've done. And I say, he doesn't just forgive you. There has to be a payment when there's injustice. And either you're gonna pay it or he pays it. So I remember years ago, I used to say, in a broad sweeping way that I hate musicals. I've learned now that's not a responsible statement to say. Uh, one is because I have some dear friends now that perform in musicals. Um, but it's not just for those reasons. It's because apparently I was going to the wrong ones. And I've been able to go to Broadway now. I've seen some epic musicals, absolutely amazing. But I remember the first one that cracked uh, me open was, was uh, Les Miserables. If you've never seen it, Les Miserables, uh, among many other things, it begins with a, a young man uh, Jean Valjean, who uh, both of his parents die, and he uh, finds himself at 25 working, trying to raise money to feed the seven or eight children of his sister. And they're starving to death, and so in desperation, he steals bread. And he gets arrested for that, and then thrown into prison, 
which he thinks is unjust. I'm trying to keep these kids alive. And as he rages against it, he's, he's, his stay is prolonged in prison. And as the story is told, he says he entered the galleys sobbing and shuddering, but then he came out hardened and he condemned society, condemned it to his hatred. And he came out a very hard man. And as the story opens, he's, he's released from prison and he's walking and he shows up in a city and he says, as he knocks at the door of a church and a bishop answers, he says, I've walked 12 leagues today. I went to the inn and they turned me away. A convict at that time had to show their yellow passport and the inn said, we don't want you here. He said, they saw my yellow passport, sent me away. The prison would not take me in. He said, I went to a field to sleep under the stars and there were no stars. He said, I thought it would rain and there was no good God to stop the drops. And so I've come into this town. And he says, do you have some place I can stay, a stable or something? And as he's saying that, the bishop turns to someone in the door and say, set another place at the table. Jean Valjean says, no, do you understand what I'm saying? Convict, yellow card, turned away at the inn not fixing a plate for me. Can I sleep in your barn? And while he says that, he goes, fix up the guest bedroom. And this is hatred turned to stupefaction. He's like, what are you doing, man? Do you hear what I'm saying? Do you hear who I am? And the bishop said, I know who you are. He said, how do you know who I am? And the bishop said, this is the house of Jesus Christ. And I know you're a child of God. So I know your name. Your name's brother. You're welcome here. And he brings him into the house and sits him down and he sets out his nicest silver that they eat upon. And John Valjean is so confused by this and uncertain. And then he leads him up to the guest room. And as he leads him up there, John Valjean is just so confused by the way this guy's being nice to him. He says, how do you know I'm not a murderer? And he bows up to him and the bishop just puts a hand on his head, prays for him. He says, John Valjean was very confused because anyone who had ever touched him did it to wound him. And here's this man leads him up with these silver candlesticks up the stairs into his Bedroom, he's kind. And you don't understand what to do with it. So he reverts back to what he learned in prison. I just got to get out of here. So he roughs up the bishop and he steals all the silver place settings and runs away. And he gets caught. And when he's brought back by the police, they're about to condemn him, throw him back in prison now for being an actual criminal. And yet in that moment, they bring him to the bishop first and said, hey, we just saw this guy. He's got all your silverware from your table here in this bag. Hey, just tell us that's the guy. We'll arrest him, throw him in prison. And the bishop looks over at him and says, I am so disappointed. And everyone's kind of nodding along. Yep, yep. And he goes, I sent him out to get those cleaned and you forgot the candlesticks, John, and grabs the candlesticks and puts them in his bag and says, bye-bye. The police leave. John Valjean's really confused. What's going on here? I committed a crime. I have to pay by going to prison. And what the bishop says is, no, I'll pay. This silver is what it costs to set you free. You can either pay in prison or I can pay with my best for you. And he says, I am buying your soul from perdition and giving it back to God. Now, you can't buy a soul with candlesticks, by the way, to be clear. But it's a beautiful picture. Somebody's got to pay for injustice. And the good news of Easter is that Jesus died for us. The wages of sin is death, and he did not sin. So when he died, the Bible says, he who knew no sin became sin for you and for me, that we might be right with God. He says, I will pay, not with silver and gold, but with my precious blood. I will pay for your sin. And so God can be just, and yet the justifier of sinners. He can condemn sin, but save people like you and me. So Jesus will pay, and we can be set free. And when John Valjean felt that, it says he began to weep softly like a child. And you saw this man who'd experienced grace becomes an agent of grace in the rest of the show. That grace has a transformative power. And that's the gospel. We're not earning our way to him. We're recipients of a grace we did not deserve. And it changes us from the inside out. So we have an anchor for justice. God will judge evil. And yet he has found a way to pay for it and set us free. How do we know his payment was sufficient? Because that stone rolled away. That death of the eternal son of God was sufficient enough for your sin and mine. And when he walked free, he says, now you can as well. That since he died and rose, we believe we will as well. We have a hope for the future. God has not destined us for wrath. God has destined us to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Donald Gray Barnhouse was a great old preacher and Tragically, his wife passed away and he was driving his children to his wife's, their mom's funeral. 
And on the way there, he told this story years later about the experience. He said, I was driving my children to my wife's funeral where I was to preach the sermon. And he's trying to under- explain death to his kids. And he says, as we came into a small town, there rode down in front of us a truck that came to stop before a red light. One of the biggest trucks I ever saw in my life. And sun was shining on it in just the right angle that took its shadow and spread it across the snow on the field beside it. And as the shadow covered that field, I said, look, children, at that truck and look at its shadow. If you had to be run over, which would you rather be run over by? The truck or the shadow? It's an interesting question, kids. Ponder that yourself this Easter. If you had to get hit by a truck or by the shadow of a truck, which would you rather get hit by? You can tell your parents later. It's a very quiet bunch. All right. His youngest child answered and says, the shadow can't hurt anybody. I'd rather be hit by the shadow. And he said, that's right. He said, children, death is the truck and the shadow is all that will ever touch the Christian. The truck hit our Lord Jesus so that only its shadow may pass over your mother. That's our gospel. That's why we sing. That's the declaration of Easter. He died and rose for us so that whether we're awake or asleep, we will live with him. He died and rose. So we believe we will die and rise, right? It's not wishful thinking. It is rooted in a past reality. We saw him do it, so we believe we will do it. If he rose, we rise. That's our faith. So we believe in a holy God who is loving wants a relationship with us and made us, has allowed suffering to persist because of human evil and yet has done something decisive about it and now offers the free gift of grace. And one day he will judge all evil, but a payment is offered for you and for me that when we say yes to Jesus Christ, we are not destined for wrath. We're destined for salvation through Jesus Christ to him. That's our message. And when you understand it, you have comfort in suffering. I know there's real pain in this world, but pain's not the end. You got a reason for living. I am deeply relational being and I've been made for a limitless source of love for God himself. There is justice because of evil and a just God has done something about it. He buried our sin and shame in the dirt. And there's a hope for the future. If Jesus rose, I'm going with him. And so what's the best way forward as a society? I would challenge you, sometimes progress looks like innovation. Sometimes it looks like a recovery of what we lost. C.S. Lewis uh, was an atheist, uh, was not interested in Christianity, and yet to his great disappointment, became a Christian. Uh, He writes about it in his autobiography, surprised by joy. He's like, I didn't want to do it, but it just intellectually made sense, and I had to acknowledge God was God. It was very disappointing. And then he was surprised by joy, like, huh, turns out it's pretty awesome to believe that God loved me and gave his life for me. But it's interesting, a lot of people are familiar with a lot of C.S. Lewis's writings. They're familiar with Mere Christianity, it's a very popular one, and they're familiar with The Chronicles of Narnia, a great set of books he wrote for kids. But after C.S. Lewis became a Christian, he wrote a book that a lot of people don't read, quite frankly. He wrote it like two weeks after he came to Christ. He wrote it over a weekend, and it's called The Pilgrim's Regress. And it was him trying to process the intellectual journey he went on to putting his faith in Christ. And, and it's a pretty weird book, to be honest with you. He, he uses 12 different languages, which is a little pretentious and confusing. Uh, They ended up having to release it with like commentaries and sides. Uh, He cusses in it a little bit, okay? It's raw at the beginning of his journey. And yet he tells this allegory and it's not Pilgrim's Progress. It was written by John Bunyan centuries before. In his story, Pilgrim's Regress, this kid grows up in this town called Puritania. And in Puritania, they make him go to worship services every week and wear itchy clothes to come to a boring church service. Can you imagine that, children, having to put on itchy clothes you never wear to attend a boring worship service? That's what his parents made him do and he hated it. And he just saw hypocrisy in all these people who claim to worship the landlord is what it's called in the story, who lives at the top of this mountain. The landlord is just and righteous and holy and to be feared, but no one really fears him. And over time, he was like, man, this all seems fake. And yet he begins to have a dream of an island, an island that that is filled with wonder, that that piques his curiosity, stirs his desire. He sees philosophers there in his dreams about it. It's intellectually satisfying and deeply communal. And he says, man, I don't really want this hypocritical mountain. I want the island of my desire. So finally, as he comes of age, he says, I'm out of here. And if your landlord is this way, I'm going this way. And in John Bunyan's Pilgrim Progress, his character named Christian, who walks on the narrow road that leads to life, leads people like Lord Hate Good. 
and a giant named Despair. In C.S. Lewis's story, he meets like 19th century rationalism and uh, socialism. And he meets some very interesting people along the way. But his character is going all over the world looking for a philosophy sufficient to satisfy his deep desire. And he can't find it. Some are closer than others, but none of them quite answer all that he's longing for. And finally, he travels the whole world and he ends up with virtue. And virtue at sword point drives him towards the church where he didn't want to go. That was Lewis's picture of becoming a Christian. Virtue is forcing me to go to these Christians because maybe their philosophy fits reality the best. And he reluctantly assents to belief in Jesus, is baptized under these waters, and as he comes out the other side, he sees the island right across this little inlet. And he says, it's through Christ I get my desire. And then he looks at the comforter who's now with him and says, let's go. What, do we take a little boat to get to that island? And the comforter's like, what? No, no there's no boats around here. He said, actually, that's not even an island. It's like a peninsula. He said, uh, it, it juts out from a big mountain. You know, the mountain you grew up by. Because the, the landlord of justice is also the island of your desire. And you walked the whole world looking for your desire. And you found that it's the God you abandoned all along. And the only way back is regress. Walk the world again. And the God you maybe ditched as a kid, maybe for justified reasons, is actually the God you've been longing for in your heart. Sometimes progress looks like innovation. Sometimes it looks like a regress, a movement back to the God of justice and love that we lost. So friend, I don't know your story today. I'm so glad you're here. My greatest hope for you is not a little gold star for perfect church attendance. Although statistically speaking, your chances of living go way up if you keep coming back. <laughs> My hope is you'll come to know Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The message of Easter is that God came for you. There's a comfort in suffering. There's a reason for living. There's an anchor for justice. There's hope for your future. And where does it come? We believe that Jesus Christ rose from the grave and where he goes, we go. Best thing we can offer you is him. And the best thing you can offer him is you. Say, I believe you. I trust you. I'm going with you.